please uh, try to uh, distinguish between these different ideas uh, that, uh, of course, they arise from the same uh, mindset, uh, the same uh, kind of attitude in quantum gravity, but they are alternative uh, proposals. So I want, as this is the first uh, lecture of the morning, uh, let's try to reconnect a bit with uh, uh, the lectures from yesterday, in particular with the lecture of Daniel and the lecture of Eugenio. Okay. So first with the lecture of Daniele. Daniele yesterday was uh, uh, talking about the quantum space. Uh, in fact, I want here to make uh, this notion a bit more precise, as this conference is about uh, uh, singularity and the possible singularity resolution uh, within a quantum theory of gravity, it's important to stress the fact that what we talk about uh, in, uh, in quantum gravity are not just quantum space, uh, they are in fact a quantum space-time. So of course, when you consider a region of space-time that is a, a four-dimensional uh, space-time region, a Lorentz space-time, uh, a finite region has a boundary, and on this boundary, um, there is a normal that is uh, selected by the boundary, uh, naturally, and on this boundary we put our states uh, between which we compute, for instance, the trans transition amplitudes and so on. So the states uh, that, lives, that, are, that uh, define the kinematics of the theory, um, if we go in a particular gauge in which uh, the time gauge in which uh, uh, this normal to the boundary is taken to be time-like, of course these states are space-like uh, space, -like, uh, space uh, uh, geometries, so then uh, there I can define the, uh, my observable of the gravitational fields that are constructed from the tetrads, and uh, so I have a Lorentz space-time on the boundary, the, uh, my Lorentz group breaks just to the rotation group, so then uh, uh, my basic operators are uh, SU2 uh, uh, generators, from them I write my uh, geometrical quantity, the uh, geometric operators for, for area and volume, for instance, and also I can write them for other geometrical quantities. This operator has a spectrum that, has a, um, that is a discrete spectrum, a discrete eigenvalues. So, so this is uh, the genuine quantum discreteness that appears in quantum gravity, but uh, this discreteness alone uh, is not sufficient to ad address the problem of singularity resolution. So you needed to implement uh, a space-time discreteness uh, that comes when uh, you uh, take into account the dynamics. So there is a very general argument uh, that you can run using the covariant dynamics of, uh, um, of loop quantum gravity. Well, in fact, uh, you have to start just with a, um, a covariant uh, um, a covariant, uh, um, you have just to start uh, from standard general relativity, well, standard, uh, you have uh, to write it uh, um, with the tetrads uh, and uh, be careful uh, to take into account uh, the host term, but then you can write uh, general relativity, classical general relativity as a BF theory where you impose uh, on the B field, uh, that is a function of, uh, uh, of the tetrads, on these two form, uh, you, you uh, impose uh, um, the B field to have this form, and uh, again, uh, when we go, if we go to the gauge I was introducing before, the time gauge, so this expression takes a very simple form that is just uh, a proportionality between uh, boost and rotation. So this is uh, just general relativity, this is just the Newton's law written in terms, uh, uh, written in this uh, funny uh, way, a, a proportionality between a boost and rotation, but then when uh, you, uh, uh, you quantize this relation, so you promote uh, boost and rotation, so you, you, prom you promote these objects uh, to be the, the generators of the boost and the generator of rotation, then you have the magic because this, you know, have a discrete spectrum, so you expect this, uh, discrete spe this discreteness would be um, uh, would be uh, inherited also by the boost. So the presence of a minimal, um, eigen, um, a minimal eigenvalue implies the presence of a maximal acceleration. A maximal acceleration is a very strong hint for uh, the absence of curvature singularities. 
Of course, this is not a total proof. It's not a theorem about singularity resolution in the quantum theory. Why? Because, of course, in order to have a singularity resolution, you have to take into account the geodesics. And to have a, 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 and in fact, there, are, there is a way in which you can have a space time in which you impose a, a maximal acceleration, but this space time can still be geodesically incomplete. But this was obtained by Gerock, and in fact, I discovered I was checking this paper. It was his PhD thesis. This is so depressing. Okay, so in his PhD thesis, <laughs> Gerock <laughs> showed that uh, um, you can have uh, such a space time. But I should say that it was quite. Uh, uh, artificial construction. So to me, this is something to be investigated and is a very strong hint that there is a sense in which in every theory based on uh, this kind of quantization, uh, you should not have uh, curvature singularities. Then no, you so can have... Yeah. <laughs> But we, we have, a, we, we are part of this general, general well, Gerrach has been also, kind of, could be considered a father also of our community, grandfather. So maybe let's hope that he will be generous to us on the long term. Okay, so this was just an introduction because uh, I wanted to state my point of view. My point of view is that uh, there I, there is no way in which uh, uh, at the center of uh, a black hole or in the early universe uh, you can have uh, a divergence in the curvature. So of course these, these things, so these divergences appear in our equations, in our classical equation, but uh, are not there once you take into account quantum mechanics. And uh, so what, I, would, uh, what I, I wanted to push also towards you is the fact that at a certain point uh, uh, when you consider the, the, when you do your calculations, at a certain point you have to remember yourself, uh, is this uh, uh, compatible with the fact that in the end of the day, this uh, divergence, this infinity is not there. So what I've tried to do in my work was uh, to try to work out some very simple models. Of course, uh, I'm not doing uh, full quantum gravity. I'm just uh, trying to work out what are the consequences uh, at the phenomenological level of this. So if, if you can resolve the existence of curvature singularity by using a quantum theory, then you lose this opportunity to refer that the curvature is getting so high that we need a quantum uh, uh, a No, that's a circular theory. argument. Come on now. So, so Something is wrong with the no, I mean, of course, the, the certain point is that there is something wrong with general relativity because of we see singularities. No, something is wrong with your claim also for the existence. You see that the, you, the, this is not a problem. I I would like to refer you to philosophers, not to physicists, because this is a logical step. Yeah, it's and, not. And, a, and also, I, I had something wrong. With It appears for me that yesterday it was concluded that we have no certainty in this. Nothing uh, is certain in life. Uh, I mean, nothing is certain in physics. These thoughts at least indicated that we have no, you know, real. Yeah, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, in the talks, for instance, uh, when uh, in the talks you have heard yesterday, yeah. people were considering, especially in the talk, for instance, in the morning, people were considering quantization that are, that are, um, that are done in a symmetry reduced uh, uh, framework. So, and uh, in a framework in which you are importing only some hints from the quantum theory that uh, you are, uh, you're working with. Here I'm saying that there is uh, an argument that comes from the full theory in which you haven't taken not you, have, you haven't taken any particular uh, um, uh, approximation and there is an argument there that is not a definitive argument but it's a strong hint that singularity should be resolved so so I, I, you are comparing a strong hint and you use an answer <laughs> Well, I'm happy to discuss this uh, later, of course. 
Again, nothing is certain. We are making uh, uh, tentative uh, uh, models. And uh, what I was stressing before, what is uh, my aim now is to try to be, I, I admit what I will do is a bit hand waving, but the goal uh, is to do physics, uh, namely to try to have predictions and observe something that is potentially observable. So, so the idea, well, okay, the, 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 the cartoon uh, of what I have in mind is that you have, uh, um, for black holes, you, uh, you can do the same as it was uh, studied for, uh, for cosmology, where you have uh, a rich literature about uh, uh, bouncing models. So you can think about uh, something similar for black holes, in which the black holes form, there is indeed, it's not like other models in which uh, you don't form the black hole at all. Like here the black hole forms in the sense that you have an horizon, but then inside the black hole the contraction uh, continues, so you have a, a region uh, um, uh, of maximal uh, contraction, maximal energy density, that, you, that connects to a new expanding phase triggered by quantum effects. So you can think about this as a tunneling through a tunnel in between uh, uh, two uh, classical states of the geometry, this uh, uh, contracting solution and a, a new expanding one. So between two classical states, so you have a classically forbidden region, this quantum region, and therefore you can think of this process as a tunneling process. So this is just a cartoon, and then uh, let's go. So as I said, I will present you different scenarios. So let me start from the, the first that I will sketch. So, so I have learned that in cosmology you can have a bounce. I imagine that I can have a bounce also for black holes. So, and and I, here I am referring to what we heard yesterday from uh, Eugenio's talk. So Eugenio was saying uh, black holes have, have a very large uh, volume inside, especially so the older they are, the, uh, the bigger this uh, internal volume will be. So this has been studied by a number of people. Uh, ask Ingemar if you have questions about this. Um, so if I want uh, uh, this very large uh, um, uh, volume, uh, to be uh, reabsorbed in the tissue of space-time. Uh, namely, if I want uh, information to go out from this uh, wheel. Uh, in fact, uh, so Tom Banks called this uh, object a cornucopia, because it's, so you have, uh, like in, in the tissue of space-time, you, you have this very, very long wheel. So you need this some time for this to be reabsorbed. And uh, so this time, uh, is in fact proportional to the, the volume, and the volume is, can be uh, expressed uh, as a function of the initial mass of the black hole, so you have this uh, uh, proportionality to m to the fourth. So, and m to the fourth will be therefore the lifetime of this object that is, uh, in fact, uh, you can think of this uh, as uh, a remnant phase. So, you can have, uh, um, so the idea is that uh, you can have black holes that uh, evaporate, uh, they arrive to the end of their life, uh, they became a Planckian, but, uh, so what, what I mean by Planckian is the fact that if you look from the outside, these objects will have a very small, uh, um, will, will have a very small surface, uh, but uh, inside they still have this very, large uh, volume, uh, and this is what determine their uh, lifetime. So you have these remnants that are stable, and uh, so again, we were, I was uh, introducing this picture in which you have uh, a, a bouncing cosmology. Okay, so if I, in a bouncing cosmology, I have some uh, classical uh, uh, universe before the bounce, they pass through this quantum phase, a tunnel, and that goes into another classical solution that is our universe, and it, that we know it's an, an, an expanding phase. Uh, people have shown that uh, primordial black holes, but by primordial black holes here I mean 
primordial in the sense that of black holes coming from a previous uh, eons, uh, 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 eons from before the Big Bang, from before the, uh, the bounce, can indeed pass uh, through, uh, through a bounce. And, uh, and uh, uh, so in particular here we are considering uh, uh, not macroscopic uh, black holes, but we are considering just uh, these small remnants of Planck sites. So you have to imagine really uh, Planck mass particles that are allowed to uh, to go through the throats of, uh, of the bounce. So the idea of uh, these objects coming from uh, a previous uh, eon, in fact, it was uh, uh, already uh, been discussed uh, in, uh, recent, uh, uh, in some recent paper by Penrose, uh, with this, uh, who gave to them this beautiful name, uh, Erebons. So Erebo, Erebo is uh, the, the, uh, the god of the darkness. So because this particle be, uh, behaves like uh, bosons, uh, bosons that uh, can, constitute, uh, uh, can constitute dark matter, so he thought ab about this name. In fact, there is also a version of this that is Erebosons. It's a very nice name. So, so I, I, I like it. So it's basically the same idea we have here. Dark matter, in fact, coming from a previous uh, uh, phase, a pre previous eon of our universe. And uh, of course, in order for them to constitute dark matter, they, sh should, be, they should have inside a volume that is uh, uh, large enough so that their uh, uh, lifetime is compatible to have still dark matter of this kind present today. So, we made a small calculation, and uh, there is a, a very funny effect that uh, uh, happens at this point. So you want uh, uh, the volume uh, uh, to be something that is uh, uh, bigger than, uh, so here we are just uh, doing uh, a very uh, uh, calculations uh, as physicists do. Um, just uh, considering order, uh, orders of magnitudes. So you want uh, the volume inside to be something bigger than the, the age of the universe, uh, the Hubble time uh, square. So if you now plug this, uh, uh, this uh, value for the volume, you discover that this... Really? Wow. We have five more minutes. Okay. <laughs> you discover that uh, uh, the... the the, the volume of the universe at the time of the bounce was all inside the black holes, uh, these uh, air bones, uh, and not outside. So this uh, gives a, a, a nice perspective on the problem of uh, the pass law entropy, because uh, in fact, uh, if, it, if it was so, the universe at the bounce would not be in a very special place, but being outside of a black hole would be, uh, be in a very special place. So, so this was uh, the first scenario. The second scenario is the following. So you can have uh, uh, primordial black holes from a previous universe. You can have primordial black holes forming within this universe. And this primordial black holes in particular, in uh, most of the scenarios uh, considered by people uh, who work on, on their formation, uh, should form at the time of their heating. So, then again, we have done a calculation to see what should be uh, the sites uh, of these black holes uh, to be uh, still present today and, uh, and, to cost and to saturate dark matter. So we have found that uh, their sites uh, should, have, uh, should be in this range. And uh, so if you would just uh, look at the Schwarzschild radius of objects of this mass, uh, you discover that, uh, so you, you, uh, you need uh, a, a, a so the radius is, of, uh, is with, within this range. And uh, this also, since the black holes, as we were saying today in the early universe, form within uh, the, um, uh, uh, with the, with the sites of the Hubble radius at the time 
um, uh, at the particular time of the evolution of the universe, this means uh, that uh, uh, they should form, the, the black holes uh, uh, we are interested in uh, should form uh, when uh, uh, the universe uh, had uh, these uh, uh, sites, uh, that is exactly the time of the heating. So this is a nice uh, um, check uh, to see that this uh, scenario is uh, uh, viable. And in particular, also, we check the fact that uh, treating the black hole as, uh, uh, um, as a quantum object and uh, taking into account the fact that from quantum gravity, we know that there should be a minimal uh, area, so a minimal surface for this black hole. This implies that there should be also minimal mass. Uh, and this uh, uh, gives uh, a, a, an argument to say that black holes with, uh, um, of Planck mass uh, are stable within the assumption that this object don't um, uh, say, don't disconnect from our universe. We are, of course, postulating, taking to, uh, we are discussing here uh, the case in which you don't have a change of topologies. Okay, I wanted to go to the third scenario and uh, I completely uh, uh, messed up with my time, but in the remaining five, four minutes, two minutes, I want, <laughs> I want two minutes, well, I can do it. Uh, I can tell you about the third scenario. I hope uh, many of you have already heard about this before. Uh, this third scenario is, uh, is uh, the one in which um, you allow black holes, uh, uh, in fact, to explode, possibly then producing the remnant I was uh, uh, telling you about uh, in, the, in the second scenario. But instead of uh, having a black hole that uh, uh, die through a Hawking evaporation, we think that uh, uh, there could be another process, in fact, a process that uh, should uh, manifest before the page time because of the firewall argument. Uh, a process should appear uh, earlier than uh, the, the full evaporation time. And, uh, in particular, this process could be as short as a time that goes as m square. So if now you, you, you look at the phenomenology associated with this, okay, skip this. So this gives, uh, again, uh, you have black holes that are uh, primordial black holes that are uh, candidates for dark matter. So if uh, they, um, die after a lifetime that goes as m square, this changes a lot the, uh, the phenomenolo phenomenology associated with primordial black holes because most of the constraints were uh, calculated assuming the Hawking evaporation. And this is a, a very peculiar kind of dark matter because it has a peculiar decay rate that goes, as I said, that depends on the mass, it goes as m square. So then you can work out uh, uh, um, what are the effects. And I wanted to stress this, that uh, uh, this uh, may have effects on the late universe. So we are used to think that if you wanted to measure quantum gravity effects, you have to look at the early universe. So here, if this model uh, uh, is true, we will have effects that will be visible within uh, uh, galaxy cluster uh, observation. And okay, and uh, okay, the, 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 the explosion will have a, a, a signal um, in terms of cosmic rays that can manifest in the radio wavelengths and the, uh, in the very high energy TIV uh, wavelengths. And they are possible, co possibly compatible uh, with, uh, for instance, with fast radio bursts. This is a possibility that uh, we are uh, exploring, in particular in Aurelien Barrault is working on this. Maybe he will mention this in his talk on uh, Friday. And uh, okay, so I can skip this, uh, but the, the, the main point is that uh, if uh, we have this kind of, uh, if we have this kind of signals, they have a smoking gun, something that distinguishes them from any other astrophysical signals that comes from the fact, again, that their lifetime depends on the mass. So the, the end of the story is that uh, uh, we have something, I go to this, the end of the story is that these uh, signals I'm discussing 
have a signature that tells that this is uh, something coming from quantum gravity and not something else, uh, not another astrophysical source. Okay, and I conclude uh, with the, the references uh, for uh, all the things I have been talking about. <laughs> Too many informations, probably. If there are no <laughs> questions, you can go on for another couple of minutes. <laughs> no questions? Can I ask one? Doesn't you're going from a, a high entropy universe with a black hole to a low entropy? No, no, no. So the, 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 the second law of thermodynamics. Yeah, no, it's exactly the opposite. The idea is that, uh, of course, uh, we observe an increase of entropy, <laughs> but the main idea um, that has been pushed by Carlo Rovelli is the fact that, uh, uh, of course, the notion of every time you compute an entropy, this entropy depends. Uh, on the observer. It depends on the particular uh, um, observables that you are considering. So, so the idea is to digest uh, uh, this fact that uh, uh, entropy is something perspectival. And here th we have a realization of this because uh, the fact that we see a, 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 year, a, a state in the yearly universe that is a low entropy state so depends on the fact that we are observer that are sitting outside of black holes and not inside. So, it's this so because of this peculiar perspective, perspective, indeed we see the increase of entropy and so on, but it's not a property of the universe, it's a property of us as being this peculiar observer. Okay. Martin. Have you thought about the first slide where k equals to gamma L? Yeah, sure. The L spectrum is not bounded unless you've fixed the total random entropy. Sorry? Yes. So the, 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 uh, the, the spectrum is bounded from below, right? And so there is a minimal eigenvalue of the, the minimal eigenvalue of the minimal area gap here, right? What is L? Is it the square root of L squared or is it? Well, uh, <laughs> L is uh, the. Um, well, I, I, I was skipping uh, the, the, the whole discussion of this because, of course, uh, I have to go to... So I can uh, associate this feature with that of a, a, an accelerated observer. And this accelerated observer... Uh, so then what I wanted to... Uh, what I wanted to measure is indeed... Uh, uh, so I have, if I have an, an accelerated observer like this, uh, goes, for instance, from uh, here to there. So with L, I can integrate uh, that L square, and I, I obtain uh, this area. And in particular, so this area can have a minimal eigenvalue, and this gives me the fact also that I have a minimal boost. But it also has eigenvalue zero. Sure, of course, you can have also the eigenvalue of zero, but the point all the time when we look at singularities in uh, quantum mechanics uh, is the fact that you have a minimal uh, a, a gap between uh, zero, the zero case and the minimal... Uh, but you can be anywhere between these two values in terms of expectation values that really depends on what state you have. Mm. The expectation value of an operator with a discrete spectrum is <coughs> not in a discrete set. Mm, okay, I'm not sure. I, I, I would be happy to discuss this uh, with you because I, I'm not sure I get your point. So maybe it's better if we discuss it. But then your statement about boundedness here really depends on what states you have, and that depends on how you solve the constraints. So, okay, the states. Uh, so can you, okay, if you wanted to discuss this, uh, can you um, repeat how about again? We move on to the second talk, okay? Uh, by Nick Krasinski, so get, this is the first of several talks on BKL. We'll be talking about the 9 singularity. Thanks very much, Francesca.